About a year ago, the Stearns Tavern was set to be knocked down. But thanks to the efforts of many people here today, and many who couldn't be with us, a few weeks from now, we're going to pick it up again. It's going to be its second trip, and we're going to move it to this location. Well, it's one of the oldest uh, buildings left in the city of Worcester. Uh, it's the last tavern, uh, original tavern from the city of Worcester and it was slated to be demolished and this piece of Worcester's history and Worcester's past was slated to be uh, lost forever and so a very unique group of uh, partners came together uh, to try to figure out a new life, a new purpose for the building that would protect it and actually make it an important part of our community. And I think the perfect combination of people came together so today's move is going to uh, move it from this site on Park Avenue, bring it to Coast Pond, where its permanent home will be as part of a bigger park that will be a universally accessible playground. The building will be used by the Seven Hills Foundation, a training center for people with disabilities and a amenity in a public park where they'll sell ice cream and sodas and hot dogs and other things that will make the park even a better experience for families and visitors. When we had decided that we wanted to obtain this property, and uh, Deb Packett and I were inside the building one, one particular day. I was actually on the phone with the city manager. We're talking about it and he was saying how things going and I said, well, I think they're going okay, but there's somebody outside. And I went to talk to some people from uh, who were outside. They were putting a big X on the building. And I said to him, what are you doing? He says, we're tearing down this building. I said, when? He said, this afternoon. So that certainly is how close we came to the building being taken down. I just think it's a great story for people to understand that similar to a, a previous building, the historical building in the city, Mechanics Hall, which was days from being taken down, we were just hours from being taken down. Well, we at Preservation in Worcester became aware that the Stearns Tavern was a threatened property. The owner of the property had leased it out to a bank for a number of years but hadn't been able to lease it for well over a year. He wanted to demolish the building. He went to the Worcester Historical Commission to see if the city would waive the one year demolition delay ordinance, which they didn't. So that gave us a year to try and work on finding an appropriate reuse for the building. But it was a complicated process. We, what we did was we basically had to to find a location, which is where we are. So we applied through the federal government, through Congressman McGovern's office, to uh, get federal funding to move the building. And there was money available through the federal government to move historical buildings. So they allotted us the funding to move it, uh, and that the, the, the whole complicated process that I alluded to a minute ago began. And uh, a few months later, we obtained a company and we were able to start the process to move it. We went to the, to the owner and he said that he was definitely going to demolish the building after the year. But if we were to, able to find someone to take the building and relocate it someplace else, he would give us the building. So at that point I went to the city manager and said we have this wonderful historic building on uh, Park Ave could you help us out with it? And he became very interested in it. He's interested in history. He decided that it was something that we needed to save as well. I was just uh, recently employed at CDR McGuire, an engineering consulting firm, uh, and we had just joined the Worcester Chamber of Commerce, and I was at a meeting, I think it was a construction subcommittee meeting or contractor issue meeting, and at that meeting I ran into Phil Nidri. We caught up on old times. I hadn't seen him in uh, several years and just got to chit-chatting, told him what I was up to and where I was working and a little light I guess went off in his head and said, hmm, not knowing anything about where that was going to lead to, but he started mentioning this project. After that meeting with the Chamber of Commerce, Phil stopped in at our construction trailer uh, out on Quincy Ave and kicked around and said, you know, could you guys maybe help out with uh, doing an evaluation of the buildings and some of your structural engineers? And uh, I'm kind of a history buff, like to be helping out with the community when we can. Uh, and it seemed like a great thing for us to at least 
get started with, you, you could move this, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done before you can get to that stage. So we offered some of our services, some of that ma the man hours and, and our technical expertise uh, in regards to structural engineering. So it, it just went from there. Well, at first we reached out to other people. We put it on Facebook, reached out to developers, seeing if somebody would want it. We didn't, it's really expensive to move a building and you can't move it very far because you want something in close proximity. You have to take down trees, stop lights, there are wires, there are all different things that you have to deal with. We decided to move it over to Mill Street, which is about a quarter of a mile away on public property. The building has been moved once, so we know it's possible. And some of the supports actually are in the basement still, which will make the move a little easier. But the building will be cut in half. Uh, it will have a foundation in place already. It will be moved to the site and placed on the foundation. Then we also reached an agreement with the city that we would take ownership, but at some point, once the building was moved, it would be their building. We're saving an important building that, uh, first of all, there are only two standing taverns in the city, and this one has, uh, has been altered less than the other one. It's also the best example of federal vernacular architecture in the city, so that's another thing. And then it's the history, it's the idea of going back to when taverns were in the city to a different age. There's a lot of reasons, plus it's in really good shape, which makes a difference as well. Oh, they knew. They knew where the building was going to come, and many people probably thought that their the vista that they have over Coast Palm was going to be gone. And we positioned the building as best we could so that wouldn't happen. And this, this is a beautiful area of the city, and what we're trying to do is enhance that with this. So there was, there was concerns, but they also realized that the past seven or eight years prior to us being here, this was an empty piece of land, the building was gone, the grass was overgrown, and there was no real use design for it. We had a master plan, the city started a master plan back in 2007, I think, and this was never included. The playground was, the building was not. And so we needed something to, to meld the two together. We've had many people come over and visit the building over the course of the construction, and they're pretty impressed. A part of our agreement with the city is that Preservation Worcester will hold a re historic preservation restriction on the building. So that, that will protect it down the road from being altered in a significant way without some careful thought and coordination with Preservation Worcester. So you know there is something here and it's something that the city will value for generations to come uh, and you're, you're saving a piece of our history that, that predates so many other buildings in the city with so much change going on when you can anchor something and say this building's been here for over 200 years. Uh, not in this location, but it's moved around quite a bit, uh, which makes in and of itself that story that much more interesting. The history of this building in terms of its use is, is significant. Uh, it was an antique store, and then to my knowledge the next group was the Harringtons and they had a house of carpets, of which I probably bought a carpet when I was coming to the, into the age of renting a house or something. Uh, they, they were very much involved in the community. Mary Harrington was the vice principal of South High School, so she was right here. She, she was an integral part, the family was an integral part of the neighborhood, and their family grew up there in the 50s and 60s. You know, so they, they also experienced a lot in terms of this history of this building. And I think that's significant. And to have the Harringtons be part of the present renovations, they've been here a couple of times. Uh, they were impressed with it. They haven't seen the final product. And they'll see that soon. And I think they're gonna be really pleased by the fact that we, we maintain the integrity of their home. This was the home, their home. And I think it's important to, to emphasize that, that, that it's had a variety of histories, but at the same time, this is a new one. This is a new mission, and it's going to have just as much impact on the city of Worcester and this neighborhood as they did. We moved in in October 1960, um, and this was the first time my father was able to have the business 
with the house. So we were going to live in this big house. We had lived in one floor of our grandparents' house for a long time. And so we had all this space. Um, every room had a fireplace in it. And of course my father was there like all the time where it was different before that he was working elsewhere. His store was elsewhere. You know, he'd come home late. And, so that, that was all new to us, and we lived there until 1973, 1973. We had a lot of interesting experiences there, and a lot of it had to do because of the house and where the house was. Living on Main Street was quite different. Even as a young child, I think I was taught to appreciate the age of the house and the history that it had and the, the uniqueness of it and I could appreciate the antique glass pane windows and the, the wooden floors that were original with the house and the tavern itself was a fascinating place for me to s sneak down and explore whenever I had the opportunity. It was always cool down there so back then we didn't have air conditioning. We were lucky to have a fan in a room to cool off and so on a hot summer day to get down into the tavern it was nice and cool and comfortable so I'd like to, if there weren't any customers in my father's store, I would sneak downstairs and just poke around at things. It was always something new to discover every time you went down there. And There was a map on the, the wall that was painted and it, it showed from, I want to say, uh, the Massachusetts New York line all the way to Boston. And it had different landmarks painted along the road map. Uh, to Boston and so that was pretty interesting to always find something new pictured on that map and then of course to look at the old whiskey bottles and just see how old they were. One of the things that, that always caught people's eye was the Paul Revere room. That was the one of the front rooms. We had our living room on one side and then the Paul Revere room was called that because on the four walls you could trace, it was all painted, hand painted, no wallpaper, and it was Paul Revere, his ride all the way around Lexington, Concord. The, it, it was the history of Paul Revere's ride, and everybody, when they came into the house, that's what they would see. And that was always like the place where we'd have photographs taken, or we had Christmas trees up there, and um, that was like a special Room. I remember my father hired a painter from the Worcester Art Museum. He just restored the entire room by hand, of course, and I remember him because I would come home from school and show him my artwork, being proud as anything, and he'd encourage my artwork. So he was a very nice gentleman, and he was there for months and months. And my father had a lot of pride in that house. The furniture that he bought was to that period. So the rest of the furniture that he had was all that colonial early American design and he worked with the decorator at one of the furniture stores. The dining room table had to have the Hitchcock chairs. The coloring of the bookcases and everything all went with that period. He loved the history of the house and he was a, a Holy Cross graduate. He really um, loved Worcester and, and really wanted a business that looked good and and that was I think part of what appealed to him as having the the business in that house that it would be a signature business and it was and Harrington's house of carpet was right on the outside of the building you'd say to somebody well I live down Main Street where where Harrington's house of carpet is and, and they'd know people would come in just to see the house and then come into the business they weren't buying carpet but they'd come in <laughs> So he had a lot of pride in it and then he worked hard to keep it looking good. It always looked good. It was the best carpet company around. He, he took care of people. He, he really cared about if they were happy with their product. And he did the best work of anyone around. And he felt that way about his house too. It, he wanted only the best, both of my parents. Living on Main Street gave him like the opportunity to, to kind of have that landmark because we had a bus stop right in front of our house 
and uh, so people would see it all the time. We were just up the street from the ice skating arena. It was Maine South, but it didn't look like Maine South looks today. And it, there was the residential, and then there were a lot of businesses that you could walk to and shop to. And um, actually, when we were there, the first McDonald's went into Worcester, right up the street. <laughs> you know, that that was a big thing. <laughs> Living on Main Street, that particular part of Main Street is a little bit of a hill, and in the winter time. It would be awful. You'd watch the cars try to get up there and it would be terrible. And, and then on the other side of it, we had a couple of accidents where they smashed into the fence. And my father was not going to let that fence just sit there. My brother had to go out there and once the fence got back up, he had to paint every picket that was on there. And he just got it done and another car smashed into it. <laughs> So that took a while to get done. I had the understanding from what I heard that the house was built around 1790. And most people wanted to believe that George Washington slept there, but none of the documents lined up with him being in the area after that point. So that's why it was never confirmed and it was never established. But it was always implied by people that he must have slept there because the house was so old. If you look at um, like the floors and how the, the wood was put together, wooden nails were used there. Um, that was the evidence that we could see. You could you know, look under the, where the roof was angled and, and you could see all that. If you take tours of other houses that are documented and you look at the style and you look at the fireplace and you look at the the floor and the wood and, and you can see the similarities. We were told that was the maid's quarters up in the attic because there was a side bedroom that had an old iron bed in it that came with the house. And then there was a full bath with a clawfoot bathtub. Under a skylight. Under a skylight. And of course the toilet and a small sink. And then there was a room up at the top of the stairs into the attic to the left and then beside that room was a door that you could slide over and when you, most people couldn't stand up but as a kid I could stand up in it and it had uh, racks, wooden racks on either side of angled shelves and it had old alcohol bottles, whiskey and whatever else there was but very very old cobwebs, very dusty, dirty and it was kind of scary to be there. It, when my brother and I would sneak up there, we'd get nervous and then we'd run out because we thought there was a ghost or something there. <laughs> so we didn't spend a lot of time there. In those days, I don't remember houses having, you know, a master bath with the, the master bedroom. And in this house, our parents' bedroom had a small bathroom attached to it, a full bathroom. And that was kind of unusual. Even though they had a full bath in their bedroom area, it was tiny. It was small, oh. yeah, it, yeah, things were small. The front door, when you went out, you were given a key, and the key was about this big to get in the door to get home, because they always kept it locked. The doorbell to the front door of the house was a pull knob, so it was in the center of the door. Well, you pulled it out, you had to pull it out with quite a bit of strength and there was also a big brass door knocker. But people loved to ring the doorbell. The kitchen that, that we had was attached to the house when we moved in. They had it there, but um, we renovated the whole kitchen after a couple of years because there was an enormous dining room which had several closets to store china and when my father renovated it because he sold carpet, um, we had carpet in our kitchen. Nobody ever had carpet in their kitchen, and that was kind of fun. And then he also improved, there was a porch on the back, and he put jealousy uh, glass windows on it, so we had like a nice porch there. And then it went into a backyard that was huge that went down to the carriage house that um, was a good-sized building down there for storage, but, you know, we had plenty of play area front and back. Where it's going at Coast Pond is not that far from where it was on Main Street. It stayed right in that, that area. It's moved, this is the second time it's moved and it hasn't gone that far. I was glad that it was going to be moved and I think it's going to a, a very 
picturesque. I think it'll be pretty there, very pretty. Well, we remember when it was moved in 74. We had like a party on Main Street. We were sitting all along there. We had our chairs and all the neighbors came and you know, all our friends came and we spent a hot Sunday in the summer watching them and it was meticulous. It took forever to get it down that slope of Main Street. The poor house, you say the poor house, you know. I think it was a company that came from close to the Cape and they were experienced in, in moving houses. Those were the days that a lot of the electrical wires were on the street and so they had to prepare and take those down and you know work around them and go under them and it, it was quite a job. I think this time should be easier. It was my father's essence in the house. It was the last time, excuse me, it was the last time we were there as a whole family because my brother died while we were there. It was 19. He was killed in Vietnam. John Daniel Harrington. My father passed away and my mother was selling the house because it was too big and we weren't going to continue the business. It was hard to find the right person for that house. Different people looked at it. They were going to put a similar business in there and have their home and that didn't work. And, um, you know, people had suggested restaurants and stuff like that. And it was, it was very hard to find somebody that wanted to use it as it was. And then Ed Maha from the Home Federal Savings Bank loved the house and felt that he could put the bank in there, but he thought it needed another location with more visibility. And so he, he was very enthusiastic about it and really played up the whole thing and, and, and very kind to us too, as far as keeping us in the loop, because when the bank opened up, my mother got to cut the ribbon. My mother was able to cut the ribbon with the mayor and she was thrilled. So we were part of it. Words cannot adequately express how excited we are to be able to work with Preservation Worcester and the City of Worcester and Seven Hills Foundation and our participants in making this absolutely stunning facility available for the children and, uh, and adults of, uh, of Worcester. This is a tremendous addition to the culture, the vitality, and the overall benefit of, of, of the city and all of its participants. But what it brings to the city is a, a melting pot, if you will, of children from all backgrounds and races and family uh, histories and uh, dynamics uh, into one spot um, along with people with developmental differences and brain injuries um, who learn to live with each other, how to support each other. It is primarily a training place for people with disabilities, but it's very much a community building. We're going to encourage neighborhood groups, that type of thing, to come in, have meetings here, have their monthly meetings here, whatever it may be. We're going to encourage people to come in and use the building. Uh, the cafe is going to be here. It's going to be run by the individuals from Seven Hills who are in a workforce training program to learn how to run a cafe. So it's going to be a very much uh, a community building as it is a training center. This is a very unique building in the city and now people from all across the city and the state will be able to enjoy it. But I think the most exciting part was the connection with Seven Hills and the fact that it's a training site that that people are going to benefit from working here. Families that go to the park and maybe would have a person with a disability will be able to come in and interact. I think it's just inspiring. Our programs at Seven Hills will involve job training, will involve socialization and engagement with the community, landscaping, facilities management, a whole host of support services to make the facility look and maintain its beauty and its integrity. And through all of those efforts, people with disabilities acquire new skills, a job that pays, 
uh, the dignity and, and the self-respect that goes along with that. And perhaps the, the greatest wisdom in this whole process is dismantling the stigmas of disabilities so that we can all think of uh, the folks that are going to be served here, uh, not only the children but the people with disabilities that we serve, not so much as a disability but different abilities. And so we hope that many of the uh, people that are going to be working and maintaining this site through Seven Hills uh, are going to uh, acquire new skills and more importantly become uh, inextricably linked with the community and the children and the families that come and, and participate here. So rather than a, a separation, we're, we're bringing together an inclusive community. It is a community event. It's a community event, as I had mentioned, at a, a, an old barn raising where everyone came together and made something come together and build a barn in a day and, and then help the neighbor out. Well, you know, through Phil and the City of Worcester's efforts, they've brought this building, in a sense, barn raised it, and now everyone's going to get to enjoy the use of it. You certainly think of neighbor helping neighbor, and you, you think of New England ingenuity. That You'd always try to preserve something. You didn't discard things as we do today, where you knock a building down. And here we did, we did something different. We were able to save it, a building, bring it back into use, and have people coming in and, out of, in and out of here every day, appreciating the aesthetics of the building on the outside, but then knowing that Seven Hills and what they're going to be doing inside is making a difference on hundreds of lives every day. Preservation Worcester is delighted with the outcome. I think it's well, well beyond what we anticipated. Our involvement is, is more, and that was great. The community involvement is way beyond what I expected. Uh, we ran into issues along the way, but I think they've all been resolved very well. Um, compromises have been made at times, and uh, we're just delighted with it. And the memories are going to be living memories, not so much a static memory, but the, the memories are going to be in the, uh, the eyes and the, 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 the minds of little children attending this beautiful park, um, uh, the guests and, and uh, businesses and community organizations that are going to use the the, the, the facility, the, the tavern as a meeting spot. We hope to host uh, musical events and community dining um, sponsored by various restaurants throughout the city. We want to make this a living entity that produces memories, particularly for the children who come here, who will be able to say 20 years from today, best park uh, was on the shores of Coes Pond in Worcester, Massachusetts came together better than I even hoped it would. It looks so amazing. Not only the restoration of the rooms to period time and the furnishings that kind of help interpret and tell the story of the tavern. So a historic building that was able to incorporate some modern uses like the cafe space and the lounge space. It's just the perfect combination of uses for this great building. I think that's one of the exciting things about this building is since it was built in 1812, there are so many stories connected connected with it. And we were fortunate to have the Harrington sisters be able to observe it move twice since they actually resided in the house and hear about weddings and different things that have happened there. But that's one of the great things about buildings is they tell us the history, they tell us our past, and now this building is going to tell us our future too. Anne is somebody who is a hard worker who desperately wanted a job in the community, uh, wanted to make a difference, wanted to pay back to community. Anne is going to be a, an anchor employee here for Seven Hills Foundation, who had previously been a client of Seven Hills Foundation. So uh, we're really looking forward to, to bringing a community together with people of, of different abilities, uh, as well as individuals with uh, traumatic brain injury. Tell me a little bit about how excited you are about this. I'm really, really excited. For it. Have you always wanted to work in a cafe or restaurant? Yes, I did. Retail. Oh. With my retail background. Are you hoping to meet new friends? Yes. You'll see you'll see the same people, some of the same people every day. Yes I am. You know, tell me about that. Awesome. The bonds that you'll Yeah. You'll the have. bonds I will made will be awesome. What do you hope to learn or experience? To see test and how to make coffee. And more 
and and more in customer service. How do the park and playground and pond look to you with the beautiful building, the yellow oh, building? Awesome. Always uh, tougher to um, deal with existing conditions. Because once we get going on a job, then we start to make our own conditions so that we prep how we want to and make sure the ramps are the certain way to approach the new foundation and all that. The mural is not original, but it, we believe it was painted in the 1920s and it's beautiful, it's charming, as are a lot of the interior features in the building. So what we have here is a um, classic painting um, that has been, painting technique that has been done for a century of years. It's a canvas, it's a, most likely an oil ground and there's oil paint on top. Carefully over the original paint and tip because I can't touch with my fingers the, the paint. It's original and I, it would stick to my hand or it would fall down. So it's a very uh, tedious process and then also uh, inserting the glue sometimes in just these millimeter, less than 100 millimeter cracks of the paint and uh, then slowly um, move the paint back to its uh, original positions. I think I'm making good progress. <laughs> wow, this is fast compared to the last time. It took two days and it was hot. It was in July. We had the biggest party because we all had our friends there and they could come in and we could cook out in the back and bring the food out front and we watched every part of the parade from beginning to end right there. When people saw the building, they knew the history, they saw the location, they knew the connection with uh, the city and Seven Hills, they knew the building would have a new life. Phil said, if, you know, this thing's gonna go, and when you find out from Worcester Preservation Society that there's a historic value to this first or second tavern in the city of Worcester, um, you, you want to preserve these buildings. We could only move the historical parts of the building, so in other words, the vault, we wouldn't want that anyway, but we had to disconnect the vault from the building. We had a drive-through to disconnect it. I mean, you're out there all day long in the summer. It was the summer, was it yeah. July or something? Yeah. It was hot. I mean, you, I mean, we had food and everything, but it was like taking forever, and it, nothing was happening to us, because we just wanted it to... I'm amazed at the quality of the workmanship inside it now. And you know the outside's beautiful. The inside is as is, 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 is beautiful as the outside is. So we're grateful for the opportunity. We're grateful for the city, of Preservation Worcester, all the donors, um, and all the people within city government to put away all their egos, set them all aside, and said we need to do something great. We need to do something magnificent that no other town has done. And um, here it is.